great to see you. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started, folks. Are we recording? It looks like we are. Please join us in singing invocation. It's in your bulletin or on the screen right here. Hear us, God, for we are praying. Hear us, God, for we are laughing in our joy. Hear us, God, for we are crying out to you, wondering what will be, what will be. Speak to us, God, for we are listening. listening. Speak to us, God, for we are waiting for your voice. Speak to us, God, in our hearts and all around. Tell us what can be, what can be. Good morning, church. Good morning. We are a people of extravagant welcome, and we love to say, no matter, no matter who, who you are, are where, where you are on life's journey, journey you, you are, are welcome, welcome here. here. Sorry for a moving target, Joanne. Our um, uh, land acknowledgement today, we're going to learn a little bit more about the Sigoriate Land Trust which um, is a land trust that was started by Chochenyo Ohlone folks and have been expanding here in the East Bay to work with Bay Miwok and others. And um, the sh um, they just sent out a newsletter at reminding us that it's Shumi land tax season. Shumi land tax is a voluntary annual contribution that non-Indigenous people can make to support Sigoriate Land Trust's mm -hmm. critical work returning Indigenous lands to Indigenous hands. And this was the, the cover of the newsletter. Um, if you already give Shumi, another way to support is to share Shumi. Let your neighbors know, ask your boss if they've heard of it, organize your reading group to participate, see if your school or city would consider participating in a uh, voluntary gift to support indigenous women land work and, um, and rematriate the land fund. Our purpose is to return indigenous lands to indigenous hands to rebuild a land base in one of the most expensive real estate markets in the country. This rematriate the land fund is dedicated to cover expenses associated with bringing land back into indigenous stewardship including the purchase and care of land, capital improvements, permits and fees, studies, surveys, remediations, restoration, and related costs. In the last two years, we have purchased five land sites with the funds from the Rematriate the Land Fund, including a part of Canyon where our own Karis Dahlkamp lives. And they've told him for the next two years, he and his family are gonna be able to live there rent-free because of their values in um, stewarding the land and overseeing it according to native ways uh, while they do some fundraising to be able to figure out how to use that land. So this, um, there's a lot of different ways that the funds get used. They say, as we begin to heal and transform the legacies of colonization, genocide, and patriarchy, and to do the work our ancestors and future generations are calling us to do, we invite those who have benefited from stolen land and settler colonialism to contribute to our vision of rematriation, to help us build indigenous sovereignty and support our movement to rematriate the land. Thank you to everyone who has contributed so far. I've given multiple times over the last few years. They also have uh, in their newsletter um, a little bit on restoring the land and waterways by Robert Williamson. And it reads, our land restoration team has been tending to ancestral Lijan waterways by clearing and pruning the riparian area at one of our land sites. This work helps open up the canopy to allow more sunlight in, making the creek more accessible for both human and non-human relatives. 
and promotes fire safety by reducing fuels. We also build some steps with the support of some of our community partners. We look forward to continuing to build relationships with both Lejeune land and waterways in the healing exchange of reciprocity. We've also planted more natives to help support the biodiversity within the landscape, totaling over 100 native plants at our ear height Ujima site in the fall, right before the rains. Picture here are some native buckwheat, black sage, mugwort, and what is now known as West Oakland. So learn more about your local indigenous land trust. If you just look up Sigoriate Land Trust, um, it's pretty easy to find. It's right in the name of their URL. So our announcements uh, came in the email, and they look like this. It included a picture of Mary with Merdell and those that were able to visit her. We have lots of birthdays. Megan's birthday, Megan uh, McGarvey Golden. She took McGarvey as her middle name. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Shirley Thomas, Edie Landstrom, Shri Krishnan, Anne-Marie Parker, and anniversaries for Mike and Betsy Sullivan and Eva and Tom Umholz. So let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, everybody. Happy birthday to you. And you see there's a church rummage sale on May 20th. Can anyone tell us about that? Carol, you want to come? I'll come to you so that the folks at home can hear. Because they may have stuff that they want to donate to. We are going to have to work during the week, probably all week that week. So the previous week before May 20th, I need people to sign up. So I'll start that next week. I didn't want to do it today. But uh, think about what day you're available and if you can help at least one day during that week. That's right. Thank you. And what you're going to donate, you're going to bring for the rummage sale. What you can clean out of your garage for the rummage sale. Mm -hmm. um, we're continuing with this exciting book by Reverend Shonda Ja called rebels despots and saints we're going to be reading through the end of chapter three this week and of course wednesday happy hour social hour from four to five on wednesdays helps us connect and gail's going to lead us in the lighting of the peace candle oh god we pray for our country May we be a people of humility, generosity, and compassion. May the weakest among us, the ailing and the unfortunate, mm -hmm. the elderly and the ill, be shown your justice and mercy. May those who are oppressed be set free. We pray that hate and acrimony may give way to love and harmony. We invoke Christ's peace. Help us to open our hearts to your peace so we may be peacemakers in your name. Amen. Amen. This morning, it's my turn to talk about ancestry. When Will asked me if I would, the first thing that popped into my mind were, were my grandmothers. And I, you need to know, if you don't already, that my grandparents lived on the same block in a little town in Oklahoma, just opposite corners. So they knew each other long before my mom and dad ever got married. They were all friends in this small little community. 
My granny Nickel, my mom's mom, was the mother of 14 children. She was also kind of the matriarch of her family. She took in a younger brother and sister when her parents died, various nieces and nephews and other folks who needed a home or a meal or whatever. So there were always lots and lots of people at her table. By the time I came along, she was in her 60s, and I remember Granny Nickel just always looked tired, as you can well imagine. <laughs> she, I don't remember her laughing a lot, but she was full of wisdom, things like, eat what's set before you and say nothing about it. Do it yourself, and it will take less to do you. One day, if, and, oh, and another thing, she never allowed us to call children kids. We had to say children. Kids were goats out in the yard. Children were our offspring. And she would not allow us to say shut up. We could say hush. We could say be quiet, but we could not say shut up. We couldn't call each other stupid or crazy, although so many times I wanted to with my little brother. But one day, my brother and I, probably he's four years younger. I'm going to guess him at maybe 10 or 11, which would put me at 14 or 15. And I was just so convinced that whatever the topic was, which eludes me now, I was right, and I needed to convince him. I needed him to say to me, you're right. Well, try telling that to a 10-year-old boy. We argued and argued, and finally my granny said, hush, children. And I said, Granny, when you and Grandpa have a disagreement and you know you're right, what do you do? And she said, well, as long as I know I'm right. <laughs> that wasn't quite enough for me, but with Granny, it had to be. Now, around the corner lived my Granny Palmer, my dad's mom who was the mother of four, and her children were widely spaced apart. So my dad, who was the baby, was almost a generation younger than the oldest child. So his um, nephews were almost his contemporaries. And um, this granny, because she had apparently a little more time on her hands, she was, the, she was very round. She was very sweet. She. Um, I went to her church when she passed away, and they ended up having a testimonial service in her honor because she had been a Sunday school teacher for 75 years. So she had taught children and their children and their children. So they decided to honor Cora Palmer, my, my grandmother, and everyone in the, in the place who spoke, and there must have been 50 or 60, said, I never heard her say an unkind word about anyone. And I turned to my cousin and pointed to myself and said, that ship's already sailed. <laughs> but I come from both those. I'll, I'll let you figure out which one I take after more. But they were very strong influences on my life, even though they were 1,500 miles away. My parents made sure we went back and spent most every summer with them. So I got the benefit of their matriarchal wisdom. And for that, I'm very grateful. Wow. Amen. We owe more to our ancestors than we probably want to let on. And as we reclaim this African tradition and keeping it alive for us, we share those names of our own ancestors that have shaped us into being who we are today as we pour libations. And if you run out of names to say, just say Ashe, which is Yoruba for amen, like Amen is for Jewish and Amin is for Muslims. Um, you can also say Ashe. Pat and Betty McGarvey. Herbert and Winnie. Bill, Bertha, and Fred. Michael, Ryan, Curtis. Ashe, Ashe. Bayard Preston, James Baldwin, Ashe, 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 Ashe. You can stay seated for this one as we continue to go deeper in our own heart and even our own body to be able to
Let us share together our opening litany. May all people see the love, care, and compassion that is God. God, God is, is our counselor, counselor and therapist. They, they help, help us heal, heal and walk life with our siblings or ourselves living, living with, with mental, mental health, health challenges. challenges. Please rise. Hear, O oh God, our prayers of hope, reconciliation, and wellness, that we may feed your, on your journey, you on our journey. God loves us through all our blemishes, and we respond by grabbing on to hope. God is a holy counselor and journey partner that holds us up with a beacon of their love today, tomorrow and always. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Let us build a house where all can dwell and all can send to a place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, both of faith and vault of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true. Where all God's children dare to see, to dream God's faith anew. Here the cross shall stand as witness and as wormful of God's grace. Here as one we claim the faith of Jesus. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where love is found in water, wine, and wheat. A banquet hall on holy ground Where peace and justice meet Here the love of God through Jesus Is revealed in time and space As we share in Christ the feast that frees us All are welcome, all are welcome all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where hands will 
reach beyond the wood and stone to heal and strengthen, serve and teach, and live the word they've known. Hear the young captain, the stranger, the image of God's face. Let us bring an end to fear and danger. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Please join with me as we pray together. O oh God, as we gather this Sunday, we lift, we lift mental, mental illness, illness out, out of the, of the shadows, shadows and into, into the light the to talk openly about things that are often whispered, if they are talked about at all, and to confront the stigma that keeps people from dealing honesty with matters that are more common than we might care to acknowledge. Bless us with determination and persistence as we strive to create safe space in our congregation for all people, including those dealing with mental health challenges, whether fleeting or lasting. And give us courage and wisdom to keep the conversation alive and to make it meaningful and helpful. We, we ask, ask this, this in the, the name, name of the one who loves us all, no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey. Amen. Amen. I am one with the heart of creation. I am one with the heart of love. I am one with the soul of the spirit. I am one with God. Oh, Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us offer each other a sign of Christ's peace. Peace, peace. and love. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Singing. Lord, listen to your children singing. Lord, send your spirit in this place. 
listen to your children singing. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Our prayer families for the week, Patsy Nash, Libby Brownrigg, and family, First Presbyterian Church, San Leandro, and beautiful Christian UCC in Albany are our prayer families this week. Let's check in with the church at home. We see Ken and Anne and Lucille. It's so good to see you all. Do any of you have anything you'd like to share? Joys or concerns? Joys. A joy to see you, Lucille. All right. Our um, sister Mary uh, had some visitors this week, and you've seen some pictures and the uh, e-blast that came out this week. So continued prayers for Mary up in Grass Valley. Joys and concerns that are here with us today at church. We're pretty blessed, apparently. All right. Yes, prayers uh, for a friend of mine, Harry, who has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Prayers for his wife, a good friend of mine, Marlene. Also prayers for my neighbor, Charles, who fell and broke six ribs. So he's suffering a little right now, so prayers for his healing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Can we get an update from Merdell about Mary? What? An update about Mary. Oh, no, the Dexheimer saw her this week, so I'm hoping to go on Thursday, but so I haven't heard anything new this week. Did you want to share anything about an update? It's debating who you want, who went. <laughs> I hadn't gone to see her before, so it was it was very nice to see her, but kind of heartache as well. Um, she is improving a little uh, slowly. She's feeding herself now, and uh, it was just wonderful to see her smile. So. Mm. Lord, in your grace. Mary, Mary had a, a, a brain, brain bleed or stroke a few weeks ago. Yeah, Bo. All right. So um, it was a boy in size. Um, but, uh, Can you turn your mic on? All right, Lord, in your grace, hear our prayers. Any other joys or concerns that we bring with us today? All right, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all of the good gifts of life, the ability to have friends and belong to community, and we pray that you would remind us what a blessing that is, even when those times where sometimes our relationships get strained. The blessings of community that allow us to not only know others, but to be known ourselves is such an integral part to being human. Help bless our relationships, God. Help us find those supportive 
families of choice and friends that have been our support and guide and companions on the journey of life that make life such a blessing to be able to live. For those that are living with loneliness, O oh God, for those living with mental illness of any sort, we pray that you would be a real blessing. Help us to also be a blessing to them and to learn how to be in relationship with folks that are experiencing that. Help us be your people in all of the ways that matter, O oh God. As we continue to see so much gun violence in our nation, as we see even an increase of homelessness and hunger here in California, we pray that you would help our elected leaders and make the difference to so many that are living without shelter, living in need. Help us be a part of that answer as well. And help us pray this radical prayer of Jesus as we sing his Lord's Prayer this day. Holy Creator, we praise your name, your will in heaven and earth the same. Supply our needs, Lord, from day to day. Let your forgiveness light our way. Lead us away from temptation's hold. Deliver us, Lord, into your fold. For all the kingdom, power, and praise with you began and with you stay. from 1st Peter chapter 2 and before we do that we need to open our hearts to hear God's word in scripture today so pray with me please God our helper by your Holy Spirit open our minds that as the scriptures read and your word is proclaimed we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Help us accept each other as Christ accepted us. Teach us as sister, brother, each person to embrace. Be present, Lord, among us and bring us to believe. We are ourselves accepted and meant to live and live. Help us, O oh Lord, to lessons as in our daily life. We struggle to be human and search for hope and faith. Teach us to care for people, for all, not just for some. To love them as we find them, or as they may become. Thank you, Lord, your acceptance, change us so that we may be moved. In living situations to do the truth in love, to practice your acceptance until we know by heart the table of forgiveness and laughter's healing heart. Lord, for today's encounters with all who are in need, who hunger for acceptance, for justice, and for bread. We need new eyes for seeing, new hands for holding on. Renew us 
with your spirit, Lord, free us, make us one. First Peter chapter two. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This honor then is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner. And a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the, a word of God. All creation is a word of God. All creation speaks volumes of God. Good morning, church. Good to see you. And good to be together. It's May. It's uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. And we're um, looking at the scripture through that lens today. But the other lens that I want us to um, think about this scripture, and especially um, a lot of what we hear in our, uh, even some of our hymns and some of our um, theology is a problem for Western Christianity. And it's an anthropology problem. How do we describe the human? Are we basically sinful? Are we basically unblessed um, or are we somewhere in between? And um, we've been telling people, especially in Western Christianity since Augustine, that people are at their core evil. Calvin came along a thousand years later, 1100 years later, and added that we are totally depraved, the tea and the tulip that some of us may have grown up with. And so it makes us, it gives us a different spirituality among Catholic and Protestant Christians in the West than what we see in the East, which does not have a theology of original sin. That we are originally corrupted in the Garden of Eden and that somehow through um, a sacrificial atonement of Jesus, this gets elevated in the year 1099 by Anselm of Canterbury, who uses that theology to teach the Crusades and encourage people to go do war, Christian holy war, against Muslims to retake Jerusalem from the Muslims. And so we can see that there are real consequences for this theology, this original sin, as Elizabeth Knowles um, points out in a uh, Oxford Dictionary, is the tendency to evil supposedly innate in all human beings held to be inherited from Adam in consequence of the fall. 
The concept of original sin was established by the writings of St. Augustine and the view of some early theologians that the human will is capable of good without the help of divine grace was branded a heresy. We could only be good with divine grace. And there was another guy up in the um, Britannic Isles during this same period who was a monk named Pelagius. And he and Augustine were writing past each other, fighting over a lot of this. And Pelagius um, is uh, thought of as a heretic by many, especially those that want to keep original sin as the basis of Christian anthropology. Um, they, this is um, from a site that was against Pelagius. Um, an unordained monk from Britain, they say, Pelagius, living from 354 to 420 AD, has the distinction of contributing one of the most pernicious and prolonged errors in the history of the church against the truth of the church regarding Adam and Eve and their fall. Um, and, I don't, and I don't think that we have to follow this anymore because I think even though it's a part of our Western tradition, it's a huge mistake that we made. Elevating a wrongful definition about who we are as humans. Now, when we look at all of this, we can look at um, all of these doctrines of sin from the past, this hamartiology, missing the mark, um, which is really um, the, the definition of the word sin itself in that uh, Greco-Roman world, as well as in the Hebrew world. It wasn't always rebellion against God. It just was like being a little off the very center of the target when you're doing archery. It's not being 100% um, right in the middle of the very target, that kind of thing. But um, what, so what we see uh, from original sin is that an ideology that sin is inherited from our original ancestors who rebelled against God. And so it's a pervasive plague for all of us. And it's a lot of it's based on this Psalm 51. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time of my mother conceived me but they've kind of blown it up into this whole theology that we only see in the West. Whereas Pelagianism, which I think held to some of the earliest cores of Christian theology, says Adam only set a bad example for his descendants with Jesus consequently setting a good example and original sin did not taint subsequent human nature so that people are still capable of choosing good and evil without the help of God which they still call a heresy on this slide. It's so ingrained in our Western culture that I don't know how we um, separate it from us because this is the basis for so much of the honor and shame and guilt and shame culture that we have that, tr that gets used in order to moralize us or to tell us that we are so bad that the only way that we can be redeemed is through a relationship with God and the church. But we've, we can also see that, that original sin is the minority report in the history of the church um, because we see it coming up not only with Pelagius, but it comes up with Joseph Arminius even in the Protestant Reformation, which denies predestination, that God only predestined some to heaven and some to hell rather than allowing for the role of free will in our lives, right? Arminius even says God's provenient grace, the Holy Spirit, is allowing humans to exercise free will and the elect and the possibility of rejecting God's grace, the election of believers being conditional on faith. So we know that this is um, a debate that's been going on in the church for some time, but what if we got it right? Or what if we at least made it more nuanced to be able to say human nature needs to be defined as both our weaknesses and our goodness both together and hold that intention between our blessed abilities and our tendency towards selfishness and greed? What if we had a definition of humanity somewhere in between? And so we come to our scripture today, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may proclaim the excellence of God who called you out of darkness into her marvelous light, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So now in that we know God through Jesus, 
We are recipients of God's mercy. We are members of God's family. We're part of God's very foundation, even though some may stumble over that cornerstone. Now we are God's own people, created to serve others the way God does. This gives us a better theology for service, too. Not to be just a chosen people in order to be chosen, but being the chosen people, as in the Jewish people being the chosen people, was always in order to be of service to others, not to be God's favorite. Right? And so I wonder on a May Sunday like today how this influences our theology of mental illness how our definition of the human influences the way we see each other, even when one in four are affected by mental illness. One in 30 experience PTSD, people of color having less access to care, suicide, the third leading cause of death, and 8.6 million adults having suicidal thoughts or ideation, and children with anxiety dis disorders least likely to receive treatment because we know that that's the world that we live in, right? So if we come back to our anthropology question, can we add human illnesses, including mental illness, to the spectrum of human abilities and limitations? Where does that fit in our definition of the human? As Aquinas said, if you make a mistake about creation, you're gonna make a mistake about God. If we make a mistake about how we describe ourselves theologically, we're going to even make a mistake about God, whether God creates junk or not. So if May is mental health awareness, maybe we can say each of us has experienced mental illness at some points in our lives. Have, are any of you brave enough to raise your hand that you've had an episode of mental illness in your life? How do we allow the stigma of that to decrease in our culture by helping talk about this much more? I love some of these quotes that um, I'm sharing. If someone is panicking, they're scared. If someone is rambling off news headlines, they're scared. If someone is angry, they're scared. If someone is judging how many groceries others are buying, they're scared. If someone is buying all of the toilet paper, remember, the, remember those days. They're scared, like a child, when someone is scared, they deserve more love, not less. Remember love, remember all have the capacity for it and that it can be endless. We need more love, not less. Um, this is a really um, in your face message. Depression and anxiety and panic attacks are not signs of weakness, they are signs of trying to remain strong for too long, asking people to post this on their social media page for a day. Let's share support for mental health awareness and show those who are suffering that they're not alone. One in three of us will suffer with this at some point in our lives and will need love and support. Never underestimate the pain of a person because in all honesty, everyone is struggling. Some people are better at hiding it than others. Does that resonate with anyone? Do you know anyone that struggles to even hide it? Glenn Close said, what mental health needs is more sunlight, more candor, more unashamed conversation about illness that affect not only individuals, but their families as well. Tipper Gore said, we know that mental illness is not something that happens to other people. It touches us all. Why then is mental illness met with so much misunderstanding and fear? So much misunderstanding and fear. I like this one. Mental health problems do not affect three or four out of every five persons, but one out of one. It's a part of being human. Sometimes it comes with brain injury. Sometimes it comes with trauma. Sometimes it comes in just hard parts of our lives. Mary Lambert says, I think it's really important to destigmatize mental illness in any form. I think there's a lot of people that are carrying around guilt and shame and baggage for crap that doesn't matter. Everybody is going through something. Everybody has something that they've had to overcome. Caring for the mind is as important and crucial as caring for the body. In fact, one cannot be healthy without the other. 
It's like two sides of the same coin, right? You'd never say, it's just cancer, get over it. Sometimes the way we talk about mental illness needs to change as well. Why do we say that about depression? People who die by suicide don't want to end their lives. They want to end their pain. I think we need to talk about the lives of those that we've lost through suicide. We need to be more willing to talk about that. And the pain, not only that it affects us because it's such a shocking thing often, but um, what does that mean for honoring another person's full humanity, even if they take that step? We all have a battle to fight. Don't fight alone. Every time you share your story, a part of you finds healing, and yet another part sweetly pushes you into the realm of personal greatness. Diana Ross, what a great quote. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to feel stuck. It's okay to feel confused. It's okay to feel lonely. It's okay to feel hurt. It's okay to cry. It's okay not to be okay. Above all, be kind to yourself and refuse to let negative feelings trigger you into waging war on yourselves. And this is where the stigma can really be hurtful, is when we're not allowing ourselves to be able to move on in many of those places. I'm not afraid of my truth anymore, and I will not omit pieces of me to make you more comfortable. Has anyone said that to you? That can be an important moment to really, really listen, really be there for someone. I may have mental illness, but that does not mean that I, I am that mental illness. I am still a person who has thoughts and feelings just like everyone else. And of course, our UCC um, widened the welcome and uh, accessible to all curriculums, as we've shared a bit about this in the past, has some uh, suggestions for five simple things that we can do. Number one, be a friend. Two, be an inspiration. Three, watch your language. Four, be a stigma buster. And five, learn the facts. Um, and there's even scriptures that remind us about this. In some ways, our uh, wisdom literature in our Bible is a, a form of human psychology to encourage us to be there for each other. Be a friend from Proverbs 13. Rash words are like sword thrusts, Proverbs 12. Uh, stop the stigma. We who are many are one body in Christ from Romans 12. Educate ourselves. Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice from Proverbs 8. Thank God for our neurodiversity. Wonderful are your works. Being aware that all, we all process the world around us differently, even though we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So this is something that we will keep coming up with in, in May, not until we get it right, but just as a reminder, to remind us that a part of the call of the church is to be community and safe place for folks that are at their highest highs as we celebrate baptisms and weddings and their lowest lows as we walk with folks in their valley of the shadow of death or even around the death of their loved ones. Uh, we can remember this quote from Natasha Tracy, mental illness is the only disease that can make you deny its own existence. Certainly the idea that the brain can deny its own illness is a frightening thought. And remembering that we may not always be in our right mind, but we are still a member of our community. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And this is true for any invisible illnesses, especially those where we still present as very abled um, being able to recognize the limitations that we may have. Bill Clinton said, mental illness is nothing to be ashamed of, but stigma and bias shame us all. And that really is the work of the church, to continue speaking about this, to deny that. And finding some new ways to be helpful for one another, right? Don't be afraid to talk about mental health. Hi, Dave, how are you feeling these days? A lot better, Pete, thanks for asking. There's good and healthy and um, supportive ways to be talking about it. Jung Pueblo says a hero is one who heals their own wounds and then shows others how to do the same. Uh, James Martin, who's a radical uh, Jesuit priest, said what Jesus never said, 
Feed the hungry only if you ha they have papers. Clothe the naked only if they're from your country. Welcome the stranger only if there's zero risk. Help the poor only if it's convenient. Love your neighbor only if they look like you. Never said by Jesus, but sometimes we find excuses to say those very same things. And we need self-forgiveness in order to move forward for ourselves. So when we make mistakes, learn from it, move forward, make amends, move forward, right? And take care of yourself. Self-care is not self-indulgence. It really is self-preservation, as Audre Lorde um, has taught us. I love this one. Get comfortable saying, thanks for correcting me. I didn't realize that. It can take a certain level of humility for us to learn new ways of, of being. I hadn't thought of it like that. I understand now. I was wrong about that, and I've changed my mind. I should do some more research before I argue this point. What would Facebook be like if that was <laughs> used on a regular basis? There's no shame in being wrong, only in refusing to learn. If hurt people can hurt people, imagine what a healed people can do. And that's the work that we're trying to get to. So instead of you're okay and just expecting people to bounce right back from falling down or whatever, here's some other things you can say. You're safe. How can I help? I'm here with you. That was scary. What a tumble. It's so hard to wait. Are you feeling hungry, tired, nervous, left out? Mental health and awareness also should be for us an opportunity to share those resources that we know can be so life-saving for so many. There's a National Suicide Prevention Crisis Line, 1-800-273-TALK. You can text um, the world, um, the word whole uh, to 916 688 for 226 or the Trevor Lifeline, which specializes in support for LGBTQ youth is 1-866-488-7286. And teen help for any teens can be 1-800-TLC-TEEN or 310-855-HOPE. It's okay to ask for help. And here's a prayer as we end our time today from my friend Rabbi Rami Shapiro. May we discover through pain and torment the strength to live with grace and humor. May we discover through doubt and anguish the strength to live with dignity and holiness. May we discover through suffering and fear the strength to move toward healing. And may it come to pass that we be restored to health and to vigor. May life grant us wellness of body, spirit, and mind. And if this cannot be so, may we find in this transformation and passage moments of meaning, opportunities for love, and the deep and gracious calm that comes when we allow ourselves to move on. Let us go deeper, not only this month, but each time we come together recognizing our ability and opportunity to be the people of God to one another as we practice here, but also in our daily lives with everyone that we meet. Amen. As we come to a time to return our gifts, we ask that you place your offering in the plate in the front here on the, tab on the table or during the offertory or in the back or, or here in the front during the last hymn or in the back as you, as you leave. Um, if you cannot give in person, um, please send your offerings to Merdell Dibdahl either online or by mail, which you'll find in your e-blast or in the announcements that we have. reach out and fingers trace the beauty of a loved one's face. We thank you, God, that love relies 
find gifts of grace, not seen with eyes, when fingers tell, and sings express, our prayer and praise, and thankfulness, we thank you God, that hands can sing, you bless the silent songs we bring. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts. Creator Christ and Holy Let us dedicate our offering with this prayer. O oh God, in all that we do, all that we say, and all that we give, may we support the well-being and flourishing of all of your creation. May these gifts help us to build the community of care and compassion that we hope to create. May they be a legacy of justice, hope, faith, and most importantly, love. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we prepare for this sacrament of liberation, I wanted to share this quote from Rachel Held Evans, a young evangelical woman who wrote many books. She said, this is what God's kingdom is like, a brunch of outcasts and outfalls gathered at a table, not because they are rich or worthy or good, but because they are hungry and because they said yes. And there's always room for more. What we do at this table, which is not a Presbyterian or a Congregationalist table, we do to be able to live into this moment and this teaching of Jesus that invites us to be that radical bunch of outcasts and outfalls gathered at a table because they said yes. And this table is God's yes back to us, saying here you will find sustenance for your journey. Let it be so for us today. On the night of his arrest, and as he shared a meal with his friends, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his followers, saying, Share this bread among you. This is my body, broken for justice. Do this to remember me. The bread of life for all who hunger. And in a similar way, at the end of that meal, Jesus took a cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples. One single cup to share. He said, share this wine among you. This is my love shed for a better world. Do this to remember me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice for they shall be nourished. God of love, spirit of compassion, bless us and this bread and wine May this meal be food and drink for our journey, renewing, strengthening, and sustaining us. And together we say, the cup of compassion, compassion for, for a broken, a broken world. world. And so as we um, sing the song, you can uh, take the elements out of your cup and eat them and sing as we sing this a couple times. Oh, to the table of 
graves come to the stable of peace this is Christ's table not just yours or mine come to the table of love one more time Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of peace. This is Christ's table, not just yours or mine. Come to the table of love let us say these words together we have eaten bread and tasted juice in the name of jesus the christ we now commit ourselves to lives of justice and compassion amen let us stand to sing our closing song I could sing. Oh, better the mountains and the sea. Your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Oh, oh I feel like singing. It's foolishness, I know. When the world has seen the light, they will sing with joy like we're singing now. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I will sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love Sing of your love forever. I will 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 sing of your love forever. As our sending forth, join with me as we say these words together. We affirm that we are part of a wonderfully mysterious universe, that all life is interrelated in one vast web, that our role lies in nurturing all life and the planet itself, 
that human beings are genetically one family and of equal value, that every human being has the right to the basic necessities of life, that each of us is on an evolving spiritual journey and that we are called to work to create a world of justice and peace compassion, compassion and, respect. and respect. So go out into the world and do something that won't compute. Plant sequoias, even in a time of climate change. Love the unlovable. Touch those around you with the love, joy, and peace of Jesus Christ. Go out and do something so radical that people think that you may have mental illness even if that is what gives you joy, be people of joy, be people of love, be people of compassion. Let us live into that most of all. Please be seated as we finish our postlude with verses three and four of when hands reach out and fingers trace. When broken bodies will not mend, we thank you, God, for Christ our friend. In him our healing can begin. He welcomes all the wounded in. And when the wings we learn and grow are not the way that others know we thank you God that we have learned your love's a gift and never see you at fellowship hour blessed be and go through your houses and get rummage sale stuff together <laughs> Thank you. 